And we're going to sit because, pardon me. We should thank her first. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And thanks to y'all for coming. I know yes. it's, uh, everybody has a lot of demands on their lives, and we appreciate your being here tonight. And our goal is really to be as helpful as we can and as open as we can. And this is informal. So, so after we talk, we're going to engage in discussion with you. And we, um, well, each of us can talk forever. I know that. I know that about both of us. But we're not going to. We're going to try not to do that. We're just going to give you a few minutes of each of our backgrounds and kind of what we're doing now. Uh, we certainly have some topics. I, I think topics from the audience would be great. Um, uh, so. Let's just take it from there. So my history, briefly, uh, born at the Stanford Hospital, so I've been a Silicon nat native all my life, um, currently 52 uh, and 3 quarters, as my children point out. Um, I didn't know telling our age was part of this. Well, you don't have to. Okay. I'm just, you know. Um, I, uh, I, I was not a geek to start with, if you want to use the, you know, and I agree, it's a, it's a term of endearment. But uh, my undergraduate degree was in creative writing. I then tried to get a job and discovered that creative writing degree majors really didn't get very good jobs. And I, because I was in Silicon Valley, the first job I got was working for a startup called Tandem Computers as the editor of their company newspaper. When I was at Tandem Computers, I realized that everybody getting ahead in the business had either an MBA or an engineering degree. And I decided it was too late for me to get an engineering degree, but I could go back and get an MBA. So I went back to Stanford, I got an MBA. And then I was fortunate enough to have a brother who was a brilliant programmer. And remember, this is back in 1982 uh, time frame. He was working at the World Bank. And he realized that people kept asking him to write for formulas for number crunching over and over and over again. This is pre-spreadsheet. And he came up with one of the early <coughs> ideas for a spreadsheet called T-Maker for Table Maker. The, it made tables of numbers. He worked for the World Bank. The World Bank thought, fine, but we don't care about that. My brother wanted to start a company around that, couldn't sell his way out, out of a paper bag, never wanted to talk to a customer or anybody for that matter. And I said to him, I will start your company with you and for you, um, but you need to make me the CEO of the company because, because people want to meet with the CEO. And, you, and you, you can be the programmer, and you can be the big shareholder, but I want to be the CEO. My brother agreed. And that's how I got started. So started in 1982-ish. Um, by 1983, graduated, started, long story short, ran that company for 14 years, raised two rounds of venture capital, sold it. Um, somewhere very late in that process, got married and had two children. In fact, had one before I sold it, one after. So then that's a whole topic we were talking a lot about earlier today, is how do you balance all of these things. Um, I then went to work for Apple Computer, where I was the VP of Worldwide Developer Relations for a year. Uh, it, is, it is often said in America that everyone should own a British car once. Uh, and in Silicon Valley, everyone should work for Apple once. And uh, kind of for the, many of the same reasons of that love-hate exotic relationship. Well, I, I started at Apple. I was hired in the Mike Spindler administration. I started the day he was walked out of the building and Gil Emilio was announced as his replacement. And I left six weeks after Steve Jobs came back to the company. And that was all in a one-year span. So I uh, worked for Apple for a crazy year. Went off, became a venture capitalist, did that for eight years, and then uh, decided after the dot com boom and bust that I'd sort of had enough of that. I'd been on um, 20 something boards, uh, decided that what I wanted to do now was, was kick back a little bit. Um, I have teenage daughters, wanted to spend some, some more time with my daughters. I wanted to live abroad, I'd never done that. So, right now, for my career, I'm on two public boards. Uh, one of them is TiVo, which some of you may have heard of. It's a digital video recorder company. And we hope you'll hear a lot more about it in the next year, because we have a big deal with Virgin we'll be rolling out here in the next um, year or two. And the other one is the Yellow Pages of Canada, which, um, which of course, everyone knows what the Yellow Pages is, and everyone knows what Canada is. So that's pretty <laughs> easy to explain. Uh, very interesting company. And uh, I'm also currently an entrepreneur in residence at the University of Edinburgh's uh, business schools e-business club and my email address is Heidi at Roizen.com and I am happy to talk to any of you uh, anytime while I'm still here I'm here till Christmas so that's my story and now I want to introduce my dear dear friend Ruthann 
Okay, so Heidi and I ended up in the same place from different directions at the, at the same time. I think we've known each other for probably 30 years, but we only really became friends about five years ago. Um, and I like, you know, people always like to tell you, particularly in Silicon Valley, if you're successful, I planned it the whole way, right? I knew mm -hmm. that if I started that company, like my next door neighbors, the CEO of NVIDIA, just gave an engineering building to Stanford with his name on it, um, and Jensen Yang Engineering Building, and, you know, like he knew all the way from the beginning that he was going to create this company. I'm sorry, that's bullshit. Okay, most of us luck into, like Heidi said, started out writing the newsletter the careers that we have. So don't think when you're watching somebody that's, you know, made it, that they knew. Even with their company, that they knew. It's a series of reactions, and, and if you're prepared, and you're smart, and you're willing to take risks, your company may succeed, or you may succeed, based on your ability to take the risk. I uh, was also not a geek, far from it. But when I, I went to Georgetown undergrad and uh, partial economics major, and we had an econometrics lab, uh, with uh, some professors that started uh, a company that was doing econometric modeling, of which I knew zero, but they needed people to help the professors create these models on this big deck tin in Boston. We were in Washington, so you know. Anyway, so that's how I got into all of this, and I was not technical, but I thought this was pretty cool. Pretty interesting uh, type of work. So after that, I went to work for a software company, uh, and called American Management System in Washington, started by like six uh, guys with about 22 PhDs between them, and among them. And, uh, and again, I was in a marketing position doing software. And this was, this was like in the late 70s. So computers were, you know, new, right? Forget even personal computers, weren't, weren't existing. So uh, like Heidi, I figured out I either had to get an engineering degree, which wasn't going to do well with me, or I was going to have to get an MBA. So I went to Wharton uh, for an MBA, uh, the other school on the East Coast. There's Stanford and Wharton. Um, and, uh, and while I was there, um, decided that I was going to make my uh, career about being in software. And I had to figure out where I could make a difference. So um, I, a lot of people at Wharton go into finance. I was majoring in finance. And it looked like on Wall Street, nobody understood what software was. Um, and they certainly didn't understand about this new phenomenon. This was 81 to 83, just like Heidi, personal computers were. So I said, okay, I'm going to do this. I went to work for a 200-year-old investment bank that had never had an intern work for it and had about one woman in the whole 200-year history. So it was pretty interesting, you know, slick back hair, roll top desks. Uh, and I'm coming in talking about personal computer software on Wall Street. So uh, I almost lost my job about three times. I was always the first one going to be cut, uh, you know, because this kind of wasn't making it, and it took a long time. But it turned out that I was right, and I was early. And what I did is I figured out a model for which companies would succeed and which companies wouldn't. So because I was there early, and I could express myself well, and I was right, um, I ended up being the analyst and investment banker for a few names you've heard of, Microsoft, AOL, Electronic Arts, Borland, uh, McAfee, um, and there's about 10 more uh, who I forget. So we sold Peter Norton to Symantec. So what happened is when you had this knowledge, everybody came to you, and it was like the network effect where the more you do, the more you get. So I basically just sat there and people came to me, and you know I had my five minutes of fame like everybody does. Um, I did that for 10 years. I was a partner, became a partner, the second woman partner in the firm. Uh, and then about 93, I got bored. I was like at the top of my game. That's the time you leave. You know, you, you, you know I knew that Microsoft was going to take it all over. It was starting to get dull. So I decided that I wanted to go into venture and do early stage companies, raw startups. So I joined a firm and became a general partner at Institutional Venture Partners. Was able to create companies from scratch. I did the first online gaming company on the net with uh, Jim Breyer, who is the lead guy on Facebook. So I think he got his, all his ideas from our experience, but <laughs> you know, I don't remind him of that. Um, so I did that for 10 years. Um, and like Heidi, you never, you never stop doing it. I'm still meeting. We're still funding companies. It goes on forever. Decided to kind of lay back a little bit more. And I, too, am on boards. And the board that I'm on is a large company that's a competitor to TiVo. 
Um, and in fact, Tebo was a company that we uh, invested in the early stage at my, at my firm, uh, along with Netflix. We did Tebo and Netflix before anybody cared about television. <coughs> the company I'm on is Rovi. It's actually got a $5 billion market cap now, um, which just happened in the last two years. We grew like from a billion to five billion. And uh, it's because television and technology, as you all know, is clashing. That's why I, I recommend all of you look. Uh, you're going to hear Marilyn speak about design. You want to look at areas, this is what I tried to do, finance and technology. Could I explain software to Wall Street, right? Um, Biocomputing is a really cool area now. Biology and computing, computation and computing. There's math professors now at the engineering school in Stanford. So these edge things is where I think the opportunities are. So you don't get super deep in one area, you get competent in one area, and then you kind of broaden yourself into the other. So that's about me. And that said, we're willing to we're willing we're to, to talk answer about anything, anything. Even, <laughs> even our personal lives. Yeah, even our well, and, and you know, and we and, and we do a, a fair amount of speaking in, in Silicon Valley, and we do a lot of mentoring of the next generation of entrepreneurs and also executives at places like Facebook and Google. And so, honestly, we do a lot of that, you know, talking talking the thirty five year old person who's worth twenty times what we are off the ledge off when the she ledge. didn't get the promotion and her two-year-old's at home and she's got to fly to Shanghai or, you know, whatever. But, I mean, you know, we're, we're very comfortable talking about things. We're going through a lot of changes ourselves. We have also spent a lot of time thinking about, um, you know, when you've had a successful career and you don't want to stop working but you don't want to keep getting on planes and doing all that, what comes next and how do you do that? But we're also very happy to talk about anything having to do with, with current startups, issues, funding. You know, we're, 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 we're both... Uh, recovering entrepreneurs, uh, <laughs> recovering venture capitalists, uh, so we can really any any we're game for anything. So I don't know. With that, do you want to? wanted to start Marilyn, with some questions first. Uh, yeah, I can, I can do. I don't know. Is anybody dying to ask a question right now? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, okay, I'll save my name. <laughs> <laughs> what would you find was the most challenging thing that you faced, whether business or personal, throughout having such a successful life? Well, we were talking a little bit about this before all of you came. What I, what I found is um, that I chose professions where I was the only woman. Always, always in a room this big, I would be the only woman. And that was a bonus because, you know, you were kind of an oddity, but it was, it was also a negative because you never kind of fit. Uh, you never felt super comfortable. You never felt super accepted. Um, so for me, um, that was very tough because getting promoted, um, I actually had to quit to get promoted, uh, but I was that valuable that they came and fired the guy that wouldn't promote me and, and promoted me. So uh, that, you know, hey, uh, I didn't have any money then, and it was gonna be kind of scary, but you know, you just have to kind of draw the line and say, I've done 100 times what anybody else did and it's time to, to reward me. So for me, that was the hardest to kind of, you know, be a nice person, and still get ahead in a, in a group where I wasn't super, super accepted. So, so for me, and I, I think this is an important takeaway, an important lesson, and I think we take it up for granted a little bit in Silicon Valley, is that any successful life you look at, with rare exception, will have had points of huge failure in it. And those moments that you're literally thinking, <coughs> I don't think I can get out of bed tomorrow and face what I have to face. I can't make payroll. We're not shipping our product. I just, I remember, and I remember these moments with clarity, right? I remember a moment where I had a huge scream fight at two o'clock in the morning with the VP of engineering, and there was a lot of FU, FU, and, you know, and I, and I stormed out of our, our big, huge building, you know, all 14 of us. And I got in my car in the parking lot, and I thought, okay, what do I do now? I'm the CEO and the biggest shareholder. I can't quit. Uh, there's no backup to the source code, can't fire him, and it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and we're going to go out of business if I don't, so I had to get out of my car and go back up there. You know, I remember driving, you know, another one of those moments where you're, you're big on paper, right? I was the president of the Software Publishers Association, which was our trade association. I was going to testify on Capitol Hill about the Software Rental Act, so a big Woo, isn't that girl important? And in the background, we had missed our, 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 our beta wasn't going well, and we couldn't ship the product, and we literally could not make payroll the following week, right? So, so what I would tell you is, is that the biggest challenges are 
I think the difference that defines successful people from not successful people is when you face that moment, you can either curl up in a ball and go run away and get a regular job, or you can say, I will make this work, and I will just go, I will just go in tomorrow, and I will, I will ask my employees to go for a few weeks without pay. I know there are, I know there are laws about this kind of stuff, or kite my credit cards, both of which I did. Um, you, can, you can try to make something work. And I think that making it work and figuring out when, when the road just throws some shit in your direction, and all of a sudden you're like, OK, plan A is not going to work. What's my plan B? And how quickly can I pick myself up and lead, particularly if you're an entrepreneur, because you got all those little faces. It's not that different from being a mom, right? When you're a mom and those little faces are looking at you, you can't say, I don't know what to do. You have to say, OK, guys, pack your bags, because we're going to Scotland. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's what we're doing now. But I, I really think it is about, about just look and fail your eyes. It doesn't mean you won't always fail. And, and I think that that's the, the second thing is you will fail. And you have to be able to, if you fail honestly, and you, and you fail because you, you gave it your best, and just things outside your control happen. Somebody got funded that was better than you, yeah. right? The market right. changed. Something happened. I guarantee I lost more money in the dot-com bust than, than pretty much anyone, including myself, will ever make in the rest of their lives. Just, just trust me. You could definitely jump off a bridge losing the amount of money I lost in the dot-com bust. Um, you got to pick yourself up. You gotta say, okay, I accept the responsibility, but I tried really hard. I was not the only person who lost money in the dot-com bust. In fact, that, that was how I found solace, is there are a lot of much more famous people and more successful who lost even more than I did. Feel good about that. <laughs> but, um, but the point is you're gonna have failure and you're gonna have huge failure. And I think the way you conduct yourself through that failure and the way you pick up and move on is is really going to be what defines whether you're going to ultimately be successful or not. And to take some risks, because like when I quit, um, I, I was so scary. I mean, the crash had just happened. There were no jobs. Where was I going to go? I had a pretty good lifestyle then. But I just knew that this was the right thing to do. I mean, it was just time. They were either going to make me a partner or they weren't. And I had to draw a line in the sand. And I knew I was important, so I knew they were going to have to do it. So uh, it was kind of ugly, but you know, oftentimes women are accused of not taking those risks, not going that extra step. So like Heidi says, don't give up, hang in there, but also take the risk. Take the risk, believe in yourself that it's gonna work. Um, and uh, don't take the lesser path because that's the easy thing to do. You will regret that. Do you have a formula? Formula for assessing risk. It's called your gut. It's you know, we feel we talk about this. We're like, you know, you're looking at an opportunity uh, and your stomach goes, Ugh, and, and you know, your brain is, oh yeah, that's absolutely no quit. And your stomach is revolting. I'm sorry, that sounds simplistic, but it's actually right. Your body will tell you uh, what's appropriate and what's not. Now I was sick, you know, I threw up a lot when I was quit. But uh, <laughs> and my friends all got together and said, how are we going to you know, keep Roseanne in the lifestyle to which she is accustomed? Uh, and they didn't figure out how they could do that. But I think I knew that, um, I knew in my heart that I was worth it. So, so there's kind of just an internal way, I think, that you know. I, Would I mean, you I disagree with that? I think there are two things. And, and there's that book, uh, Blink. Yeah, Blink, right. Which, which kind of covers this, right? Which is trust your gut, but you're, you build your gut by, by practice. Experience. And experience. Yeah. And, and so I think that to me there's two things. One is I think in your heart and your gut you know when you're making a mistake. I, I will tell you this, I, and you'll hear this across every CEO who's ever run a company or whatever, they always keep employees too long when they know they're not the right one. You always keep your partners too long when you know they're not the right one. You always keep your CEO too you long. You always keep when your you CEO. Know. I have never heard a person say, "Gosh, I thought they I, were the wrong person, but I waited three more months and it all worked out." Never. Or, never. Or, or, or I fired them too early. Or I fired them too early. Damn. I wish. Now, of course, fired them too early. You, you, you never know. know. But I kept them and it worked out. You never hear that, right? I kept them and it worked out. You just never hear that. So number one, I think there's a gut issue, a gut. Feel. But I think number two is, and, it, and it's one of my pet peeves about entrepreneurs, is 
The reason you do a business plan, for example, is not because we actually read the business plan and invest in the business plan and believe that everything you wrote and all those hockey stick charts and all those Excel spreadsheets are all true because we know they're not. They're not, and you don't know, and we don't know, and nobody knows. But the process helps you determine what are my big levers, what are my little levers? What happens if I misassess the market by 50%, by 80%? What happens if my cost of goods are double what they were going to be? What happens, what happens, what happens, what happens? And I think being, you know, to use an Andy Grove term, you know, being a little paranoid about this and doing that homework and any time you hear about somebody who might be doing something, anything like what you're doing, instead of running and sticking your head in the sand, going and looking at that, so you know, so you're informed. And it doesn't mean if somebody says to you, well, well, gee, you're doing a, you know, a giving site. Have you looked at Kiva? You can say, I don't know. Let me get back to you. And go you know, consume Kiva and get back to them tomorrow. But I think doing the homework gives you an important understanding of the levers of your business. right? And, and, and one of the things that was most compelling to me, and I, I say this at one of my boards right now, is um, uh, the guy who wrote uh, Age of Spiritual Machines, you know, Ray Kurzweil. Yeah. Ray Kurzweil, who has, a, who has a lot of really interesting material on the web, and I, he's another guy, I just encourage you to go look at his stuff. He's a little out there, yeah. but he has some really interesting stuff. And one of the things he said that really struck me is he said, an arithmetic, a geometric, and a logarithmic scale all look the same in the beginning, right? And they really do. And so when you are seeing one of those either on the way up or on the way down, it's really easy to talk yourself into it being something different. And that's really important. And so being able to understand that and being able to look at your numbers and know which of my numbers drive my business. Is it the number of users? Is it the transactions per user? Is it my um, average revenue per user? Is it my acquisition cost per user? Whatever it is, knowing that, knowing what your expectations are, and when your expectations are off either in one direction or the other, because by the way, some businesses go out of business because they're so successful, but the problem is the they money comes after inventory. the first year they cannot fund. <laughs> they can, they, they literally go inventory. broke because they're too successful. You need to know that. And, and so I do believe that there's gut and there's homework. Yeah. And it's the combination of the two gut and homework. that, that so make it work. So building on, uh, about 10 years ago, I wrote a book for first time entrepreneurs called Confessions of a Venture Capitalist. It's still it's on Amazon. Book. God knows why. Yeah, Heidi was kind enough to say nice things. Uh, half of it was taken out by my partners because you're not really ever supposed to say anything when you're a venture capitalist that exciting. But I got to keep in some recommendations in there about business models, which is really what Heidi's talking about. You have to understand the levers of what you're doing. Um, so uh, when people come to us, um, they often don't understand those levers. That's one issue. They have not looked at what's out there already. That's the second issue. The, the third issue is um, what, what I would call the Google or Facebook phenomenon. They come in and they've got like an iteration on that because that was successful, so this tiny iteration on that should be successful too. Uh, it feels safe to, to say that. Uh, and you'll see, you know, 100, uh, you know, once one company is ultra successful, 100 of the same, which is just a total waste of time. You know, you ought to be innovating, right? You're, you're, you've got somebody's ear, you've got a chance, you're not going to have it again. Uh, you need to be innovating in a big way. Um, and then we have one more thing. Uh, so oh, I, the 95%. Oh, yeah, we the were 95%. talking about this last night over a lot of wine, and so we had really big <laughs> ideas that we can't remember right now. But, but one of them was we, we were talking about sort of pet peeves with entrepreneurs. It's kind of our, you know, because now we have the luxurious position of having been entrepreneurs ourselves. Now we get to be venture capitalists and just pick on entrepreneurs. <laughs> But one of the things we see over and over again is the, the entrepreneur will take it 95% of the way, right? They will come up with a great idea. They will make it 95% of the way easy. And then they will expect the customer to fill in the last 5%. And you know what? Customers don't fill in the last 5%. And that's the hard part. And, right. and, and you know, if you ask, you know, why is Amazon successful, right? Why did Amazon succeed when so many people failed? And I really believe, and, and Ruth Ann knows much more about Amazon than I do, but I'm going to give you my answer. First of all, they had enough money to make it through a lot of iterations. And second of Take all, some risks. Jeff Bezos understood that he had to get you from the moment you thought of something to the moment you bought it from him in the fewest possible steps. 
right? I went to a speech he gave in 1998 or whenever, when I was shorting Amazon, because I was looking at the money they were spending, I was thinking, there's no For way- For their infrastructure. Can, mm -hmm. There was no way you're gonna build success. I, I lost money on Amazon. I am one of those people. And though, I at least covered my short after I, after I heard his speech, because he said, what do you, somebody asked him, what do you wish computers, what, what do you, could you wish you could change about computers? And he said, instant on. I wish just computers were on all the time. Well, of course, that happened a little bit you know, later, because people just leave them on all the time. And then they said, and what is the thing you're most trying to get to? And he said, the one-click order. The, that, that I just want you, and I'll tell you, man, I spend so much money on Amazon, mm -hmm. And the first thing I did when I came here is tried to figure out whether my prime account in the U.S. would work here mm -hmm. and how to get shipped to Mayfield Terrace where I live because... And the whole Kindle thing is, a, is an And the whole Kindle thing is too. another it's one like, of those... It's like, okay, let's just make it easy. Make it easy. And my husband is on his fourth Kindle. Um, <laughs> well, I, and I have an I iPad, has, and I spend more money on the Kindle store than I spend on the Apple store. I asked him uh, before I came uh, how many books he had in there he hadn't yet read. Fifty-two. Okay. 52 books and adding every day. He goes, well, it's just really great. I see my Adam. I see my Adam. So this is what Jeff wanted. You know, it's got to be easy to get, easy to read, easy to get rid of. But the point, the point being, so many entrepreneurs will get a great idea and they'll get it. They'll, they'll get. I'm sorry to say this. They'll get all the easy stuff done, or they'll get all the programming stuff done, or they get the stuff they know how to do done, and then they'll hit that thing that's kind of hard to do. And then they'll say, well, the customers will love this so much. That they'll do it. That they'll do it. And the customers never do it. And so that's, those are our, that's our pet peeves. Those are our pet peeves. Yeah. Um, you were talking about uh, working in the US with entrepreneurs, and also um, you've obviously worked with some of here. What, what's the differences that you've found? Is there a different uh, You should have, I haven't Well, I, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm going to answer this. I only this met the I'm investors. Say, I've only been here for two months. <laughs> so uh, take everything with a grain of salt. Everybody here is just every bit as smart. Every bit as motivated. Every um, bit as nice. Every, much nicer, actually. Nicer. That's not always a good thing. Um, that, that was that joke about, you know, we used to say, you know, I used to say, I don't want to fund any assholes. And then I looked around and I thought, all the best entrepreneurs. All right. <laughs> well, anyway, um, but I would say in general, um, <coughs> your culture doesn't accept failure the way our culture accepts failure. It's very hard to be an entrepreneur if you're unwilling to fail. Because if you're if you're unwilling to fail, you will only you will small. You'll you go will very go small. small, and you'll reduce risk. So that's the first thing. The second thing is you underestimate how much entrepreneurship goes on in your country. Because I walk down you know, the street where I live, right? Map. And there's 100 entrepreneurs on the street. They have restaurants, and they have bars, and they have this, and they have that, and they have little, you know, they're fixing shoes, and they're doing, there's nothing wrong with that, right? That's not go public, fundable, whatever, but that's build a, be, do something you're passionate about, build a great lifestyle, have a great business. That's very entrepreneurial. So the idea that this country is not entrepreneurial is really, I think is not true, but the risk aversion, and, and I don't know how you fix the cultural aversion, is, is a challenge. The second thing is, we live, for better or worse, and there's a worse to this. In a bubble. We live in the epicenter of all venture funding. We right? live in a 33 bubble. 33% of the world's venture capital is within a half hour drive from where we so live. So you have, you have universities that are geared towards creating entrepreneurs engineers and computer science and business and everything. You have lawyers that will work for free because they know that if they own that stock, they're going to be wealthy one day. So they are willing to take this. You have accounting firms that will do the work for you for free for the same reason. So you have, and plus you have the venture community there. And so, the angel community. And the a angel thousand community. thousand people who each right. are worth 20 to, 20 million to a billion who will, who who will, will write who you a will check. get these things started. And so the whole thing is very supportive of this. And this is why it's been so hard to recreate this someplace else. Universities say, okay, we're gonna build Silicon Valley here, and you gotta have the whole thing working uh, before, it, before it does work. But the, but the flip side of that is not every company is one that should raise money, or one that could raise money. Not every idea is gonna be a multi-billion dollar takeout. And that's okay. I know a lot of people have really nice lives who didn't build Google or whatever, and, and, and Ruthann and I have the perspective to know 
we know a lot of the people who did build some of those really big companies who are Having worth billions lives. of dollars who have terrible lives. So in terms of sort of like how much money you're worth and how good a life you have, the correlation is remarkably low. It just mm -hmm. is. In fact, there's an inverse correlation. In fact, we'd argue, yeah, we would argue there is an inverse correlation. And so we've had the good fortune to have the front row seat at watching some of those situations. Venture is very, raising money, and, and this is again, I'm sorry if this sounds really you know, grade school. When you raise money from other people, they give it to you because they expect to get it back someday. The only way they're gonna get it back someday is if you're so profitable you can pay them, if you sell the company, or if you go public. The chances of any of those things, first of all, Small. either selling or go public means you're gonna lose control of it. So anybody who wants to build a lifestyle business and control it, forget those. The third answer of if you're gonna pay them out of your profits, well, I hope they're like your uncle or something. Because, it's, because anybody who owns stock in your company, if you are so profitable you can pay them out of profits, they're gonna want something else. And so I, I just think there are a lot of businesses that just don't make sense mm -hmm. to get risk funding. That doesn't mean they aren't good businesses. And in our valley, the downside of where we live is everybody thinks they have to build the next Facebook or the next Google or the next something. And what you guys don't hear about are, for every one of those, the 100,000 failures, right? And, and if anybody doesn't know the economics in venture investing, the economics are more than, and these are the economics among the best venture firms with, a tw and I'm talking about 20 years of history, because um, I did this once for, for um, the National Venture Capital Association. I got the limited partners to aggregate their da data. More than half of the deals of invested across a 20 year span across all the best venture capital firms never return their capital. So here's a business proposition for you. I'm start asking you for money, more than half a chance, you'll never see a dime of it. Okay, let's just start there. Then you've got about 30 to 40% of the businesses who will return, return capital to maybe three times capital. Okay, but you already lost half of your capital. That's not gonna make up. So you're in the red. And it takes you a long time. You're six, seven years out before you even get that. Well, and most venture funds actually have a 12 to 18 year life. That's your agreement with your limited partners. You got 18 years to give them their money back, right? Okay, so how, why does anybody invest in venture? Because every once in a while- There's a hit. There's a hit. And the interesting thing about the venture business is those hits- Pay for more, everything else. They pay for everything else. And so when you're in a Google, or you're in an eBay, or you're in a Yahoo, or you're in a Skype, or you're in a, you know, Hotmail or you're in a, you know, there's different things on the spectrum. The point is, in venture, because of the way the model works, it takes those outliers. And therefore, we need those outliers. And in Silicon Valley, we are the land of the outliers, right? We are the land of the Googles and the Cisco's and the Apple's and the whatever. But that's not what everybody should be about. No, and, and there's one more thing to point out. Um, when I wrote the book, Confessions of a Venture Capitalist, I wrote it for first time entrepreneurs. And when I did a similar kind of look as Heidi's talking about, I found out that all the biggest companies were started by first-time entrepreneurs. All of them, 100% of them. Why is that? I mean, there is a culture there that you can fail and start again, but usually they're too wise to do it. They're like, okay, I'm not gonna kill myself again. I'm not, the, the first-time entrepreneur is unaware how hard it is. They're, they're like into it before it even happens. So if you look at all the giant successes, these are their first tries. And they just had really big ideas at the right time, and they tried it. So I would also encourage you to think big, too. At the same time, Heidi's right, not everybody is you know, made for taking venture and becoming you know, Zuckerberg. Uh, also, Zuckerberg wasn't Zuckerberg. You know? when he took, he's just this you know, schmo that happened to be in college at a time that thought of the idea, you know? Same with the Google guys. They were just these two nerds who, you know, were getting their PhDs and uh, said, uh, you know, hey, uh, let's, ma let's make a company. So okay, so I, you I, can have, do that I too. have two points on that. I'm sorry, this is the problem with the two of us. We know each other and, and know the material too well. Number one is, even though there are a lot of first-time successes, and I think part of that is because we're going through this revolutionary change and I actually think that there is something generational about revolutionary change and, and it's like you don't even speak the language when you're a certain age and, and people just spoke the internet at, at a time. When you look at some of the big successes, there, there were often the young guy, and it was unfortunately usually a guy, with the really great idea who coupled with the Jim Clark yeah. or, the, or 
or the John an Doerr, angel that or helped the them, somebody, or a VC that helped or them, the, or you know the Eric Schmidt, or the somebody who was the adult supervision who could help them navigate that stuff. So while I would say yes, a lot of those things were first-time entrepreneurs. They had a they had, they had a, a mentor behind them. They had a mentor. The other one, this is just totally irrelevant, but because this this social network movie is coming out here this week and came out and it's all the buzz at home. I will tell you, I, I, I had to run a panel one time, Mark Zuckerberg was on the panel, this was a couple of years ago, and I said to his PR team, can you send me his bio? And it was like, Mark Zuckerberg went to Harvard. <laughs> and, I, and I said, you know, I'm in, I, and I was introducing the other people on the panel where the guys started PayPal, and the guys started, you know, some other people had some things you could say, right? And I called his PR person and I said, can you give me some more about Mark Zuckerberg? She said, there what do you want? Anymore. He said, he went to Harvard. That's it. That's all we have. I said, does he have like a favorite band or favorite color? Or can, I, can I just do something, right? And so then she said, yeah, his favorite band is, you know, I don't remember what she even said, right? So then when I was introducing him, I said, this is Mark Zuckerberg. He went to Harvard and his favorite color is blue and his favorite band is something. And he looked at me and he goes, that's not my favorite band. <laughs> and it was like one of these moments where I'm like, oh God, you know, why did I even try? But it was, it was very funny. He was, he was actually very good. Do you have any other questions? Yeah, I was going to ask, seeing as we're in a university, this might be a bit boring, but um, do you think we should be teaching specifically computing science students in my case, do you think we should be teaching them how to think like an entrepreneur? Great question. This is a great question. From the map store. Uh, yeah, and, I, and I, I don't know, I actually don't know your position on this. Well, let's hear I, your I, position. I actually don't think you can teach entrepreneurship. Um, I think you can, uh, my, my husband taught a course at uh, Stanford, and, and Larry, Larry Page was his, was his student, so this is really interesting. Uh, <coughs> did he teach Larry Page uh, to be an entrepreneur? No. But what he taught Larry Page was he, he did some uh, business models and, and some business cases with real entrepreneurs talking about what they were going through. Was that helpful for Larry Page? Absolutely. So the reason I think you can't teach entrepreneurship is it's so experiential. Um, what you can do is learn from others' mistakes. So I think in the sense of, and that was one of the reasons I wrote my book, is it was made filled with mistakes, is you can look at what other people have done and try and learn from that. You can't learn from success because, as I said, the person will say, oh, I knew from the beginning, do this, do this, do that, and I'm like a billionaire. Oh, yeah, how am I going to copy that? But you can learn from their mistakes, from companies that have failed, from entrepreneurs that have failed. And in that regard, I think it is a body of knowledge that you could teach. And um, you could do it through cases, or you could have people come in to talk about the mistakes that they made. So what was your line yesterday in the map store? Luck favors the prepared, prepared mind. mind. Luck favors the prepared mind. So, and my intensive of it is luck. So I, I, I will give you the opposite you know, side of that story. Is I believe there are people who are just destined to be entrepreneurs, just like there are people who are destined to be world athletes, right? I mean, they're, they're just, you can't teach someone to be the best runner on the planet. But you can take someone who's a crappy runner and make them a better runner, number one. And number two, you can take a smart person who just hasn't thought about commercializing their business or what it means to be a business person as opposed to being an engineer, and you can prepare them. So they can at least know what they're up against, they can know what's required, and they can know how to pick partners, which is a big topic that, you know, that, that we've spent a lot of time on you know, in, in our years, because a lot of it is, is about partnering. So, you know, I very often got from people, you were an English major and you ran a software company for 14 years. You know, explain that to me, because how in the world did you, how did you manage engineers? And I said, well, you know, even though I was not an engineer myself, you get to the point where you understand, if you spend some time learning it, there is a development cycle, right? There are people, there are attributes of people who know how to code that you can identify. There are attributes about people who know how to manage people who code that you can identify. There's a spec. You gotta know when you're having feature creep when to call the spec. There's a, there's a time frame between when something, if you can't demo a feature, you are not shipping that product in six weeks. I can, I, can be, I can be a creative writing major and know that. It's remarkable how many engineers at Apple, Don't. when I went there, didn't know that, right? I'm sitting in a meeting, I was hired, I was the VP of developer relations, we were about to ship a new operating system in six weeks, and they couldn't demo a feature to me. And I went to my boss, who was, who was the, the CTO, and I said, we're not shipping that operating system in six weeks. 
because they can't demo this feature to me. He said, what the hell do you know? You're an English major. I said, when you can't demo a feature, you are not shipping the product in six weeks, especially, oh, by the way, when it's an operating system and there's 1,100 engineers working on this project, right? Just not going to happen. And sure enough, it didn't happen. Yeah. Sorry, didn't happen. Other good stuff happened. It's OK. But, uh, but that particular product never shipped. So I do think that even if it's, if you're an engineer and, and running a business is not your purview, is not your passion, is not what you want to spend your time doing, you're still smart enough to go figure, you know, get the basics, right? Get the basics of how to organize a company. You know, why do companies fail? I gave the speech when I got here. Um, and I don't know if the slides would make sense. I'd be happy to share the slides with you guys. But I did a little presentation called Why Things Fail, and it's never because the product wasn't good. Right? The product's good, but things fail because the capital structure's wrong, the channel strategy's wrong, wrong, the business model's wrong. I can't tell you how many times. And as venture capitalists, we always fall in love with the technology, right? Mm -hmm. Technology's beautiful. But, but things, for example, you know, here's mistake 101. I'll save you guys all this trouble. When you start a company with a couple other people, go to a real lawyer, drop real corporate documents, and vest your founder shares. Don't just give them outright, because I guarantee one of you will fall in love with someone in Zimbabwe, or get hit by a bus, or decide you want to be poet laureate of whatever country you're from, or whatever, and you will leave, and then you will own, you will, or the other person will leave, and you will be sitting there with someone who owns 25% of your com doing company nothing. who's doing nothing. OK, so there. It's worth every penny that you guys pay me to tell you that, but just please remember this. So that's just one example of if you're an engineer, and I know a lot of engineers who are, who are off the charts brilliant, who it would don't never do this. occur to them that the world might change and their roommate might actually go to Zimbabwe next quarter, right? And change his mind or her mind about whether they want to run that company or not. It is virtually impossible to get that stock back. Once you, once you issue it, right? You have to go through all sorts of maneuvers. So that's the kind of stuff that, can you can teach you entrepreneurship? No. You can teach structure. And it's one of my surprising things I've found so far about being here is you don't have a class like that, right? Now we live it, we live in the land of, you know, we live in Oz where this is all everybody ever thinks about to the expense of all other normal pursuits of life. But in, in Oz, you go take that class. And they're competing. At Stanford, there are probably seven different classes that compete yeah. with each other about starting a company that will go through. Here's your capital structure. Here's, here's all about intellectual property protection. Here's about hiring and firing. Here's you know, employment law. Here's about channel strategy. Here's how to build a business plan, a spreadsheet, and blah, blah, blah. Again, not because, because, because cash flow is the lifeblood of a company. And if it never occurs to you that the money has to come in before you can send it out again, you might have the greatest idea in the world, but you might go out of business. So I do think you can teach that. You can teach that. The infrastructure of entrepreneurship, you can teach. The, the, the art of being one, not really. I don't think. Mm -hmm. Unless, if you desperate, desperate to ask one Wait, more I quick see question, we'll clean up the code the last quick question then. Um, you touched on trying to encourage your brother to think about marketing. Um, how, I work in uh, communications and work with a lot of technology clients and we're brilliant, but trying to make the transition to encourage the marketing site can be a challenge. And I just wonder if there's any lessons you'd like to share. Well, this is the, 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 the biggest thing that kills companies is the idea on the part of the engineer that the solution is so brilliant, everyone will just <laughs> omnisciently be aware of it and come buy your product, right? So, so the problem is getting people to buy your product costs a lot of money. And in most companies, if you go look at, go look at, go look at the cap tables of public companies, R&D is a lot smaller line than marketing. It always is, um, except maybe in pharmaceuticals. Like 30%, but in, par in pharma yeah. yeah, in tech companies, it's thirty percent. It's like thirty so percent versus nine, eight, nine, nine, yeah, something like so, that. So, so it's a f so number one, it costs money, and um, and number two, it's rapidly evolving, right? So, I mean, I think one of the fascinating things about today, and this is where it's great to be a student of other people's models and go look at what's working and what's not working and. You know, for a while the buzzword was viral, and out social network, and it's this and that. It's, it's be geolocation, and it's, I don't, you know, whatever crowdsourcing or this or that or whatever. But there's merit to all this stuff. But I think understanding that it actually costs money to tell people, even when you've, when you've created the greatest thing on the planet, it costs money to let other people know that that it exists and they should buy it. 
And, and, and I think, again, the wonderful thing about engineering people is they're very analytical. And if you just bring them proof points, and the great thing is just go get public documents of, go look at what Google spends on R&D versus marketing, even Google, right? Well, if they have to spend that money, by God, your startup has to spend that money too. OK. Can you perfectly answer? Good timing and everything. Um, so we're about to have some food, but just before we do, um, I hope everybody is, a, is as enthusiastic as I am. At the end of a hard day at work, I felt a bit uninspired. And now, thanks to Heidi and Ruthann, I'm ready to storm ahead for the rest of the week. The rest of the week. <laughs> I was really open, really really enthusiastic. And I think we're really, really lucky. Um, Girl Peaks have had you both come to talk. Thank you. So thanks Thank very you. much. Thank Bye. you. Bye.